Most viewers probably won't recognize the face of our next guest, but as soon as they hear these four words... And there she goes! Then even non-baseball <laughs> fans would know that it's the voice of Jerry Howarth, who's been the full-time radio play-by-play -play announcer for the Toronto Blue Jays since 1982. Jerry was born in Pennsylvania, but grew up on the west coast of the U.S., which is where he started his broadcasting career back in the 1970s, covering minor league baseball and NBA basketball games. He became a Canadian citizen in 1994 and now lives in Etobicoke, and we expect he'll be the voice of the Jays for at least another 100 years. <laughs> Jerry, great to have you join us. Yes, well, thanks welcome. for having me. I enjoyed it. You know, and on that point of longevity, um, baseball seems to have so many long-time radio voices. I'm thinking of, you know, Mel Allen with the Yankees and Vin Scully with the Dodgers and Ernie Harwell with the Tigers. Why is that? Uh, and why isn't there more turnover with radio voices? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, a couple of years ago when I finished my 33rd season, Vince out in Los Angeles finished his 66th season. Unbelievable. It yeah. is, and, and I think it gets back to comfortability, and the more you're with a city and a team in one area, the fans get comfortable with you because it's 162 games. And I've always enjoyed that, and I think for the most part, broadcasters take care of themselves too. One of my requisites as a broadcaster who prepares is getting my sleep, take a nap a little bit for 20 minutes a day. So when you go on the air, you're refreshed, you're energized for your audience. Mm -hmm. Well, it would, shows. Would you ever consider going to another team, or is this it, and you'd never want to move from the Jays? No, I really enjoy one team, one broadcast, and 34 years now, I feel very blessed to be able to do that. But the nice thing about being with one team, from Paul Beeston all the way on down to so many, they have your back, they're with you, they help you, and you need that strength too because so many things can happen throughout the course of a year, throughout the course of a career. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go back to the beginning and, and tell us, Jerry, how a guy like yourself, a young guy, fresh out of the U.S. Army, uh, manages to find a job in radio broadcasting, and also, did you ever dream at that time that it would turn into a lifelong career? No, I, I did not. In fact, I'm a senior boys basketball coach at Etobicoke Collegiate. And I always tell my players every year, and I've been coaching there 20 years, if somebody would have told me in high school you'd be a major league broadcaster for over 30 years, I would say no way. But I tell my players that the answer is yes way for two reasons. One, get as much education as you can, and then go follow your heart and your desires. And then to answer your question specifically, Helen, after I, yeah. after I graduated from the University of Santa Clara in 68, I did go to the Army through ROTC. I was the first lieutenant in Frankfurt, Germany. Came back, I was in law school for one year. My dad thought that would be a good position to fall back on. But after a year, I left to pursue something in sports I didn't know what. And I was fortunate that my alma mater, Santa Clara University, said, why don't you be our first ever fundraiser in the athletic department? And as I started that job, the football and basketball games were on a little 250-watt station, KPEN, and I tried to get on to maybe enhance, enhance my career as a fundraiser with heightening my profile, never dreaming that I would be told, no, we're not going to go in that direction. The, the broadcaster didn't want to work with anybody else, so that was okay. But it was a challenge for me to buy a tape recorder. I taped football and basketball games for two years at night, our, our games, while I was raising money for the athletic department. And after two years, people said, that sounds pretty good. Why don't you take that to radio? I, we think you could do that now. Mm -hmm. And that started my career in Tacoma, Salt Lake, and Toronto. Wow, that's terrific, yeah. Um, the Blue Jays started, of course, in 1977, and you came to the team in 82. But when you got the call, from the Blue Jays to be their announcer. What was your reaction? Was it yippee or was it, oh no, the last place team in a city that has igloos? <laughs> well, my first reaction was as I applied for the job in Seattle, they came in with Toronto in 77. Uh, I interviewed with Lou Gorman, the general manager, and I didn't get the job. And then I was disappointed because Tacoma is right outside of Seattle, much like Hamilton is to Toronto. But my wife, Mary, suggested I send in my tape and resume to that other team. And uh, I didn't really know exactly where Toronto was. Yeah. I found out. I said, I don't know. And she said, no, get your, get your work out there. And I did. It turned out to be the best move that I ever made because Toronto, initially, while they didn't hire me, they knew of me. And they hired Tom Cheek in early win. Yeah. And they hired early because of his name. He was a Hall of Fame pitcher, 300-game winner. But after five years, they wanted to move in a different direction. And they asked their third base coach, Jimmy Williams, who was the manager in Salt Lake, where I broadcast, about me 
and Jimmy gave them a great recommendation. They brought me in, and when they called and offered me three jobs, uh, three games in Detroit at Tiger Stadium, I was thrilled to be able to do that and wasn't sure what the future would be, but I knew after those three games that I could broadcast Major League Baseball games. So you and Tom were a team for 12 years before he died. Did you guys hit it off immediately, or did you have to kind of work together a little bit before you found the chemistry? And how was it working with Tom? Because he was a great broadcaster. Well, Tom was real good to me from the standpoint that when I first was introduced, somebody said, hey, Tom and Jerry, look, Tom's a big old cat, and Jerry's a little mouse right there. <laughs> Referring <laughs> to the cartoon characters. That's right. Yeah. It, it yeah. was a perfect fit. But Tom right away said to me, Jerry, you be you. Come in whenever you want, and I'm happy you're on the broadcast. And he had worked with a former player in early and I was not a former player. But I think what we ended up with, with Tom and Jerry, were two broadcasters who, number one, concentrated on the game. We both did play-by-play. -play. We came in occasionally on the other's innings to make sure the fans knew there were two of us. But Tom was very gracious that way, and our styles were different, our voices were different. And mm -hmm. I think in many ways, the best teams are the most opposite on the air. So you know who's speaking, and it's a nice compliment. And Tom was a great start and compliment for me. Right. How, how important uh, is it to have that chemistry when you're co-announcers? And I'm, I'm looking at Jim as I ask this question because, you know, there has to be some rapport there. And as you've just pointed out, there has to be a difference, too. You have to have different voices. Um, how does that chemistry work when it's radio? Well, when it works and it's really the best, then you certainly have that. And I believe right now with Joe Siddle, my partner the last two years, this is the best connection from a standpoint of a former player working with a broadcaster who does the play-by-play. -play. And together we just complement each other, and that's on and off the microphone, and I really enjoy that. Yeah. For Tom and me, when the games were over, we went our separate ways, and that was okay too. When you're with the broadcaster for seven, eight months, you're with that person more than your family, and you have to get away too and make sure you have your own quiet time, recharge your batteries. So I think that connection, Helen, is outstanding. And yeah. the better it is, the better the broadcast. And I, as I said, I had that for six years with Alan Ashby, and I'm very fortunate with Joe Siddle. This is the best that I really believe I've had with a player where you're in, you're out, and you let him analyze. And who's the beneficiary of all this? Your audience. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, what are the attributes of a good play-by-play -play man? And, you know, um, w without television, without the visual there, do you create the visual in your description of what's happening on the field? You really do. And I've been fortunate over the years to invite young broadcasters in the minor leagues to send me their work so I can listen to them. And inevitably, I send back a thought or two. and. Sometimes I'll tell them the two best words you can use on radio are right and left. Foul ball <laughs> off to the right-hand side. There's a, a ball sliced down the left field line. A ball hit over to the first base dugout. Uh, a line drive over the third base dugout. And I think description is so important. So that's something that I really try to work on. I always remember, too, a mentor of mine, Don Hill in Tacoma, said, try to give that score every time a new hitter comes up to the plate. Uh, the egg timer was kind of first suggested every three minutes, and I didn't really want to do that. But giving the score is essential to it because what happens is if you give the score every minute and a half, couple minutes, three minutes, your audience now will listen to what you have to say rather than ranting at the radio saying, give the score. Uh -huh. Now they're so not true. listening to what yeah. you have to say. Interesting. So I think overall that preparation is a big part of it, the fundamentals of radio. And then working especially with Joe, what you want to do is call the play and back off. And two things happen. One, our engineer, Tom Young, who's been very good at this over the uh, eight years that he's worked with us, let the other voices come in, the public address announcer. Let him introduce the next hitter. All those voices are different. Let the organ music come in. Let the charge come in. Let the fans come in. Let the crowd applaud, and then let, let's hear that. I remember this year when Jose Bautista in game five against the Rangers hit that dramatic seventh inning home run. Yeah. It was five words, yes, sir, there she goes. And then I did not speak for a minute and a half. Huh? Wow. That's radio. And yeah. I really love that. Yeah. All right. Jerry, I mentioned some great radio announcers, baseball announcers a few minutes ago. But in your view, living or dead, who are some of the great broadcast icons? And what made them great? Well, when I was 12 years old in 1958 in San Francisco, the New York Giants moved out. And right away, we had Willie Mays and the Giants. But we also had Russ Hodges and Lon yep. Simmons. Yep. They were two great baseball broadcasters, and I really enjoyed both of them. They were two play-by-play -play announcers. <laughs> when Lon moved to then become the 49ers football radio announcer, that became my team because of Lon. Oh. And later I met him because for 25 years, he broadcast the Oakland A's 
baseball games too. So I was able to appreciate him. When I grew up as well in San Francisco, the Oakland Raiders announcer and the San Francisco Warriors, then the San Francisco Warriors, their radio announcer was Bill King. He became a great friend of mine, a mentor. He helped me get into the profession. Those two, those three people right there were so instrumental. Now because Vin Scully was in Los Angeles, I didn't hear him. But when I eventually did hear him, I heard someone who was fair, objective, he was enthusiastic, he loved calling the games, he also highlighted the other team, and I loved the way he broadcast the game in and out. He too, let the, he was understated. He taught me right there as I listened to him a couple of times, less is more, back off, let your audience come in. And then later as a Salt Lake City broadcaster, our parent team was the California Angels. And Dick Enberg and Don Drysdale were the two announcers. It was the best pairing of a broadcaster, a play-by-play -play man with a former athlete that I'd ever heard. And why? Because Dick highlighted Don and together highlighted the broadcast. I tucked that away for the day that I might have broadcasters working with me who are former players, and that works so well with Alan Ashby and now Joe Siddle. Let's ask about when you're with a team that's not doing well in the standings and it's late September, they're in fifth place, they're not going anywhere, you're at the stadium, there are about 50 fans below you at the game, it's just awful to be there. It must be a pretty lonely and depressing job. How do you stay fired up to do your job? Well, I can answer that in a couple ways. One, it's never lonely and depressing, no matter what the score is, no matter what the standings, for a couple of reasons. One, I broadcast each game as if it's a white canvas, and I paint that to the best of my abilities. I initial it down in the lower right-hand corner when the broadcast is over. Baseball, every game tells its own story, so the one loss record doesn't affect me. Now, after 22 years, did August, September, and October affect me? Yes, they were the best three this, months. This year. Yes, yes, they were the best three months that I've ever had as a broadcaster, which includes 92 and 93. Wow. The fervor of the crowd, the passion they had, the hunger for their team, the dimension of their broadcast and how loud they were and how long and sustained it was. So that was wonderful. But to address your question too, and I told Joel Siddle this and Jack Morris too. Remember I had Jack as a, a year partner too. Yep. I told them when the game gets out of hand and let's say it's eight to one in the third inning, the other team, or let's say it's 14 to two in the fifth inning, the other team. Well, now you go to a different dimension. You come up with interesting anecdotes and stories. So at the end of that broadcast, the fans don't leave saying, oh, the Blue Jays lost 14 to two. And we heard that in the voices of Jerry and Jack or Joe or Alan. No, what they tell the story is when they leave, you remember that story that Jerry introduced to Joe and Joe talked about that? And this came up, this comes up so often. And it came up this year where after the game, Joe showed me a, a text message and it was from a teacher and a parent who said, when you two started to talk about how to throw a slider and a curve and a changeup, and then what the difference was and the effect it is on a 12 year old when they start in little league and then work their way to high school, I don't care that the Blue Jays lost that game nine to one. I learned something to help my own son as I coach him. That's what you do in those kind of games. Right, that's yeah. very powerful. It is. I I'm sure you get asked all the time whether you're a Blue Jays fan. And you don't have to answer that necessarily. But, but the real question is, how do you remain or sound uh, as though you're non-partisan uh, in your approach to all of these teams that you cover? Well, that's a good question. I am a fan of two teams. I love the 49ers and I love the Chicago Blackhawks. Oh. Now, I'm a fan of both of those teams. As far as the Blue Jays, I'm a fan of the players and I want them to do well. But as I've gotten older here, the biggest fans that I have and the, the people that I want to have success for are John Gibbons or any manager that the Blue Jays have, the coaches, because now they're my best friends, whereas I can relate to the players, and I like that too, but the manager and the coaches, you want them to do well. So for me, those are the people that are kind of important to me, and you want them to have the best possibility to be able to do their work and do it well. So it's a, it's a good situation to be in. Jerry, you mentioned the great run that the Blue Jays had after the All-Star game this past season. It was absolutely euphoric in Toronto. And then we had the playoff games against uh, uh, Texas and Kansas City. But then we had, of course, with the letdown after Kansas City, we had the incredible letdown of seeing Alex Anthopoulos resign as general manager. What was your feeling at the time? And, and was Alex as good a GM as we all thought he was? Alex really grew into the job, and the thing I liked about him the most was his honesty among so many qualities that he had. Honesty, and at the end, he shared with me that 
he started to bring in players who had character, who had abilities, but also were team players and were other directed. And I really like that. And in any profession, I think Alex had been the GM for six years. You all like to think that you can grow from your adversity. And Alex did that. So it surprised me at the end that he resigned only from this standpoint. He had done so well with Paul Beeston and had the ability to not only put everything together, but make a final decision, which was okayed by Paul. And then Paul would go to Rogers and would get the money that was necessary to bring in a David Price or others. Well, when Rogers began to assess the season and the team was 50 and 51, I think they decided they wanted to go in a different direction. Little did they know that this 2015 season really would be two seasons, the 50 and 51 season, and then the best record in baseball after that, right yeah. until the last game against Kansas City. Alex was so much a part of that and did such a great job. And I think then when Mark Shapiro came in, and I have met Mark and I've met his dad before, it's a wonderful family, good people, very uh, intelligent people. He was with Mark with Cleveland for 24 years. It was a good signing, but it also meant that the decision making was going to change. And if I'm Alex and you're used to a certain decision making process and now that has changed, you might rethink your situation, and that's what he did. Yeah, well, we've thank got to ask one yeah. very quick question. Yeah, World the Series next the World year? Series. Well, you'd love to see the Blue Jays get back to the playoffs, number one, and then a trip to the World Series would be sweet. Thank Terrific. you for that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Jerry. And after the break, we'll talk to Ontario's first privacy commissioner, Ann Kavukian. Stay with us.